Hi students, I am Dr. Siddharth Sethi and I will be discussing with you the NEET PG questions which came from pediatrics this year and I can tell you that most of the questions were from our class notes which we always discuss in our classes. So I would suggest students that number one you should be looking at our class notes and these are the topics which you need to work on because the topics will never change whether it's INICT exam or NEET PG exam. So you need to work on these topics and you know you don't need to go anywhere else just work and revise these topics. So the first question which I asked uh, and this question you know I asked in each and every class of mine was on the drug of choice for infantile spasms or hip arrhythmia. So in every class of mine all of you I discuss with you infantile spasms and I told you that the EEG, the typical EEG for infantile spasms is hip arrhythmia, which is a chaotic high voltage slow waves. And remember that West syndrome is not exactly you know synonymous with infantile spasms. West syndrome is a triad. It's a triad of infantile spasms, mental retardation, and the characteristic EEG. So the drug of choice for infantile spasms or West syndrome or hip arrhythmia is ACTH. This question also came in INICT exam this year. Only for tuberous sclerosis children, only if you have a child with infantile spasms with tuberous sclerosis, the drug of choice is Vigabatherin. Otherwise, the drug of choice is ACTH. Now, there was a question on uh, a child who has diarrhea. He is lethargic. The skin pinch goes back slowly. Which kind of dehydration is this? And each and every class of ours, whether you attended my TND or a regular batch or a foundation batch, we discuss about classifying dehydration in all of our classes. This is just a screenshot from one of my class from eMedicos. And uh, we always discuss that if a baby, if a child is irritable, has sunken eyes, thirsty, drinks water eagerly, turgor goes back slowly, it is some dehydration or moderate dehydration and the drug of choice for some or moderate dehydration is ORS 75 ml per kg over 4 hours this is called plan B now this was a child which came in your exam who is lethargic drowsy sunken eyes turgor goes back very slowly this is severe dehydration for which you'll give ringer lactate 100 ml per kg this is called plan C so all of you remember that uh, here we talked about the types of dehydration but remember that you should also remember zinc. Zinc is also a very important topic for your exams. Do remember that in diarrhea we give zinc in addition to ORS 20 milligrams per day for two weeks for children more than six months and 10 milligrams per day for two weeks for children less than six months. Now there was a question on which of the following is an autosomal recessive disorder and in each and every class of mine you know I always discuss that cystic fibrosis is a very important topic. So remember we do talk about genetics in our classes. So cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive. Remember it is the most common lethal genetic disorder in Caucasians. Remember alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, Wilson's, hemochromatosis, Frederick's ataxia, Gaucher's, they are all autosomal recessive. Now osteogenesis imperfecta, all of these, rest of all of these are autosomal dominant which are mentioned in this question. Okay. So do remember and read more about cystic fibrosis in your exams. Now this was a kind of tricky question though you know we discuss in a way in all of our classes. So it was more of an integrated question which we always talk about. A two-year-old boy, I'm sure it must have been a boy who has proximal muscle weakness. He is not able to stand from squatting position. So he has a typical proximal muscle weakness, has Gower sign and there was a muscle biopsy image. Now many students told me that sir, actually uh, they were neutrophils. So within the muscle fibers. So actually these are not neutrophils students. These are actually not neutrophils. This is actually endomycial connective tissue which is enhanced. So this was a typical muscle biopsy 
of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Typical muscle biopsy of Duchenne's. And in all of our classes, we commonly talk about, remember that Duchenne's is X-link recessive. It is the most common hereditary neuromuscular disease. They typically have proximal muscle weakness. Now remember, Duchenne's have heart involvement in the form of cardiomyopathy. And remember that mostly Duchenne's do not survive till third decade of life. So most of them die by the third decade of life. Okay? Remember, most of them die by third decade. One third of them have new mutations. Mostly 70% of Duchenne's is X-link recessive. And it's another favorite question of your NEAT PG to talk about Becker's. Becker's is a milder form which presents late. Since today we are talking about the muscle biopsy, I would like to tell you that this is a typical early phase of Duchenne's on your screen, where what you can see is, you can see that there are varied sizes of muscle fibers, increased endomysial connective tissue. This was not neutrophils, guys. You, all of you messaged, sir, neutrophils, they no. This is increased endomysial connective tissue, okay? And areas of necrosis of muscles with regeneration of muscles. In your exam, sometimes to look at this connective tissue, they may show you a Gomori trichrome stain, which enhances and shows you the typical, the connective tissue within the muscle fibers. Now, sometimes they may show you the late phase of Duchenne's. Now, on your screen is a late phase of Duchenne's where you can see that the fiber size is varied. The endomysial connective tissue is increased. You can see a lot of fibrosis and the muscle fibers are now replaced by fat. You can see all le very less muscle fibers and most of them have been replaced by fat. That's why these children have pseudo hypertrophy of the muscle fibers. So death by third decade would be the best option. Of course, this is a, you know, it's a muscular disease, not viral. Now, there, are, there is a lot of research on the new gene therapy for Duchenne's, but it is not the drug of choice or FDA approved as of now. Now, there was a question on a baby has not passed urine on the first day of life. What should be the next step? Now, students in each and every class of mine, in fact, there were two questions on this. I will not show, show you both questions, but I'll tell you in each and every class of mine, I talk about urine and meconium. In the first half an hour of my first session, I always talk about that. Remember, 99% of the babies pass urine within the first 48 hours of life. It is normal, you know, babies pass urine, first urine within 48 hours. Okay. And if a baby has not passed urine, you should ask about the maternal liker. Because after 20 weeks of gestation, the liker is mostly baby's urine. Now, in uh, each and every class of mine, you know, I also talk about that if you have mother having oligohydramnio severe, think about baby having renal agenesis. Baby having renal agenesis leads to severe maternal oligohydramnio, leads to bilateral pulmonary hypoplasia in the baby. And this sequence is called the typical Potter sequence. So, in fact, there was one question more in your exam. And the question was, if you have a severe oligohydramnio in the mother, what will you think in the baby? You will look for renal anomalies. So answer to this question was continue breastfeeds because this is normal that the babies do not pass urine in the first day of life. So 95% pass on the first day, 99% pass within two days of life. So this is completely physiological normal. Continue breastfeeding and observe this baby. Now there was a question on a four day old baby having a high TSH what would you do to confirm it? So remember, in each class of ours, we do talk about that the most common cause of congenital hypothyroidism is agenesis or dysgenesis of thyroid gland. Agenesis or dysgenesis of thyroid gland. So of course, you will look for a radionucleotide scan to look for whether it is ectopic thyroid, absent thyroid, okay? So, but since today uh, I am here to talk more about this, I'll, I'll show you and very, I'll tell you what are the important guidelines by our Indian Society of Pediatric Endocrine, Pediatric and Adults in Endocrine Society. So, we'll do talk about the thyroid imaging, but please remember that 
a baby having a TSH more than 40, you have to start treatment. Don't wait for imaging. You have to start thyroxine first. Okay. So then your next test in every baby who has congenital hypothyroidism is a thyroid scan. Okay. You may have, if you see that there is uptake at the base of tongue, it is called lingual thyroid. If you have uptake nowhere in the body, in the neck, nowhere, get an ultrasound. Because ultrasound may show you what this baby has. Whether this baby has agenesis of the thyroid gland or if thyroid gland is there somewhere. Whether it is because of maternal thyroid antibodies or iodine uptake defects. If there is increased uptake and there is enlarged thyroid gland, it is called dyshormogenesis. Okay, increase uptake in the thyroid gland and it is also enlarged. Still baby is having hypothyroidism. Think about dyshormogenesis. Okay, which can for, for that you will get a perchlorate discharge or genetic mutations. If you have a normal uptake, still baby has hypothyroidism, normal gland, then you may have to think about some transient hypothyroidism or dyshormogenesis. Okay, so I, I just want to emphasize that we do a thyroid scan first and then we do a ultrasound thyroid. Okay, so thyroid scan may show you a normal uptake. So on your screen is a normal technetium thyroid scan where you are seeing uptake of the thyroid gland. It is a utopic thyroid gland. And you can also see some normal salivary gland uptake. These blue arrows are showing normal salivary gland uptake on the technetium scan. Okay. Now, if there is no uptake in the thyroid bed, it suggests agenesis or blocking antibodies or iodine uptake defects. You may see uptake at the base of the tongue on the lateral view or an AP view. A goiter and increased uptake suggests dyshormogenesis. Here you can see that salivary uptake is not there and there is increased uptake in the thyroid gland. So today I will also tell you what is our protocol. So students, whenever a baby is born all over the world, we do a TSH first. Remember, neonatal screening is a very important topic. Do read about neonatal screening from the class notes. So the first test in every baby of the world is a TSH, a heel prick or a cord blood TSH. If the TSH is more than or equal to 20, you may recall the child. But remember, if it's more than 40, don't wait for anything. Phys do a physical examination, start treatment if TSH is more than 40. Okay, we will look for other tests, but remember, especially if the TSH is more than 80, start treatment. Okay, especially more than 80. If TSH is between 20 to 40, you repeat the screening at two weeks. If it's still more than 20, you will start the treatment and do examination. Okay, so basically, we do a heel prick. If it's between 20 to 40, you know. We try to reconfirm it. We do a venous sample also. We do a T4 also. Okay. But if it's more than 40, you know, you need to be sure. You know, you need to work on whether this child has hypothyroidism, which is severe or not. So you should work in those lines. Okay. Don't just wait in for two weeks. <coughs> Apologies. Sorry. Okay. So remember, we'll do a radionuclide scan first. I will start treatment in this. If there was a what what my next step, I will start thyroxine in this child. Let's go further. There was a question on a four-month-old child born to a HIV positive mother has diarrhea. What would you do next? So remember that we discussed in our classes that in babies less than 24 months, antibodies are not good because maternal IgG crosses placenta. And it may persist in the baby for almost 24 months. So you should do a, a PCR, RNA or a DNA PCR by a dried blood spot. So these are the guidelines even by the NACO. So you should do a dried blood spot PCR, which can be done on the dried blood spot. Antibodies are of no use. Now, it is not an indication to straight away start ART and stopping breastfeeding. So in the West, they in fact do not stop breastfeeds in the West. 
and we do need to look for you know rare organisms causing diarrhea in this child so our first test will be to get a pcr now uh, the next question was on uh, rheumatic fever you have a child who has rheumatic fever how long to give prophylaxis we discuss in all of our classes the american heart association guidelines about the duration of secondary prophylaxis we give a longer acting penicillin benzathione penicillin every 4 weeks in the west every 3 weeks in india okay every 4 weeks in the west or every 3 weeks in india intramuscular benzathione penicillin you can also give oral penicillin v or sulfas now the duration depends on if the child does not have carditis so this was the question so answer was actually 5 years or till 21 years of life whichever is longer now in your exam 21 was not in the option so the best option was 5 year or 18 years if there is a reversible carditis 10 years or 21 years of life whichever is longer if there is a residual heart disease like he has got a residual mitral stenosis residual mr then 10 years or till 40 years of life whichever is longer ideally life long so the best option here seems to be 5 years or till 18 years of life or 21 years of life whichever is longer okay now in every class of mine in every dvt i always tell you hsp kawasaki is a very important here is another question on on henot shonlin perpura guys since 2015 every exam of yours has a question on henot shonlin perpura so we discussed about the diagnosis of hsp the criteria in all of our classes and in all of our classes we did talk about that almost 50% of children who once get hsp remember henot shonlin perpura is the most common vasculitis in children it is the most common small vessel vasculitis in children it is the most common leukocytoclastic vasculitis in children and almost 50% of children get nephritis within 6 weeks of the onset now mostly we do not give steroids mostly if they have hematuria in this just have microscopic hematuria with or without proteinuria if they present with nephrotic range proteinuria a nephrotic nephritic presentation we give prednisolone if they present to us with rapidly progressive renal failure crescents then we give high dose steroids intravenous methyl prednisolone so the answer to this question was glucocorticoids we only give azathioprine in crescents later once you achieve remission these two drugs are never used in vasculitis so the answer is steroids so here i am if you have any doubts you are free to email me at my email address my email address is sitsdoc@gmail.com on facebook i am on pdf or pg and i would again tell you guys to revise the topics every time because these are the topics which we discuss in our classes are very important for your exam okay so don't miss those topics just keep on revising that look at the tnd topics the test and discussion topics which we always discuss they are very important for your exam thank you i am open to all the suggestions queries do email me tag me on facebook thank you all the best